Hi, I'm Linda Lagarde Grover, and I'm going to read you a little excerpt from my book, The Road Back to Sweetgrass. This little section is called In Her Dream, Margie. The young Margie Robineau, moving through the landscape of her early morning dream, knew as well what a much older woman all the songs and where they ended. She had danced this one a hundred times. As it neared the tail, the last minute of the fugue of drum beats and voices, she danced nearer to the men at the drum, who in anticipation of the quickening of the pace leaned forward on their folding chairs. The lead singer bent to pick a styrofoam cup up from the floor with his left hand, his right hand holding the drumstick in midair as he swallowed a mouthful of water between skipped beats. He cupped his left hand to his ear to hear as he raised his voice, the pitch a wolf singing into the wind, striking the drum harder with every other beat, volume muffled by the sheepskin wrapping on the end of the drumstick to a deep boom, felt by the girl who was Margie Endish at the back of the curved arabesque of her ribs as she danced. She watched Joe Wash's head bob now, his white hair reflecting the fluorescent lighting of the gymnasium ceiling to the silver of Lost Lake under a full moon in winter. Now, as the fugue dipped, bent, turned the corner into the tail of the song, now. The girl's gaze turned from the singers to the blur of the powwow circle, then inward. Her feet stayed with the drum, out of her eyesight, but seen in her mind as she danced, moccasins, blue skies and rivers, green leaves and vines, flowers the color of late summer, prancing and stepping, kicking and turning, sending her prayers to the creator by way of skies and rivers, leaves, vines, and flowers of late summer. When the song ended, her practiced feet neatly hit the ground on the last beat, side by side, together, toes first, heels grounded on the last split second. Hey, wah! Joe Wash didn't say it out loud. She woke to the hesitant gurgle of the toilet flushing, weak and thin on the other side of her bedroom wall, as the middle-aged Margie, who duct-taped her arch supports into her dance boots as she dressed for grand entry, and who needed more than six hours of sleep. Half opening her eyes to the osmotic fogginess of the beginnings of illumination, that gray light that seeps into rooms where morning sleepers endeavor to extend the night, she blinked at probing fingers of reality, forcing daylight through slats of drawn vinyl window blinds, prying apart the crack between drawn curtains. Did I dance like that, she wondered. Am I young? No, she remembered. I have a daughter older than I was in the dream. Crystal jiggled the flush handle to stop the irritatingly apologetic sound of the running toilet. She coughed, deep and dry rustled cellophane, her pack of camels, lit a match, sucked smoke, exhaled. Passing the bedroom door, she looked in to see if her mother was awake. Her left hand was cupped over her mouth, cigarette between her second and third fingers, filter close to her lips. Margie saw the old man's silhouette, short-legged and skinny, with those stringy, muscular arms standing in the doorway to the bedroom, gray and indistinct. An apparition, Joash. Margie rubbed the back of her wrist against her eyes. The apparition stretched, crossed its wrists above its head, and became her daughter. I'm in Auntie Beryl's trailer, she remembered, not in the allotment house. I live here. Joe lives at the hospital in convalescent care. You up? Crystal asked. How late did you work? Almost two. Busy at Chihuahua last night. Where were you? Out. With who? Just out. She glared at her mother. None of your business. Did you find out about blackjack training? Coughed, dropped her cigarette. Watch the rug. No, they haven't decided yet if they're going to have the class. Where's Aunt Beryl? Down at the boat landing. Hey, I'm going to go down there. See if I can find a racing partner. Can I borrow the rowboat, use Michael's stuff, his duck bill and knockers? I know he's not there. I'm broke. You look like hell. Who would want to race with you? Are you hungover? 
What do you think? Crystal gulped, swallowing back the dry heaves. Well, go ahead. It's Michael's stuff, not mine. Take whatever you want. He's not around. The young woman went back into Beryl's frilly bathroom. She ran water noisily into the sink while she retched, took deep breaths to settle her stomach. Pepto-Bismol, she thought. There was a bottle in the medicine cabinet. She took two chalky peppermint swallows from the bottle and retched again, knelt on the floor to see if she'd heaved pink liquid on the matching pink shag bath mat. She held a wet washcloth over her face, counted to ten, and cautiously stood. Lifting the washcloth, she saw herself, slack-faced, staring out from the mirror with eyes that looked like two pee holes in the snow, as Margie would say. Above the reflection's shoulder, two impossibly pretty Indians embraced, a vaguely effeminate brave and a Nordic-featured princess simpering in front of a pink and gold sunset. Aunt Beryl had won the laminated plaque at Saturday Night Fever Bingo and hung it in the bathroom where it could be seen twice, on the wall and in the mirror. Yuck, she muttered. She sipped water from the plastic cup shaped like a rosebud. Crystal, her mother said when she came out of the bathroom, I've been thinking about us moving back into the allotment house. Michael is just about never there, and even when he is, he sleeps in the shed most of the time anyway. It doesn't even have a furnace. But even in winter, it's plenty warm with the wood stove, and then we'd have our own place. We did fine there before we moved in with Auntie Beryl. We could take care of it, you and me. It just needs a little work. Hmm. And take a chance on running into Michael, that bum who couldn't even be bothered with his own daughter. It's a wreck. It has raccoons under the stairs. God, no thanks. Let Michael deal with that place. Beryl needs you. Yeah, but now that the weather's still nice, we could try it again, Crystal. Do a little work and get it ready for winter. Joe Wash would like that. God, I'm going to the landing. Crystal picked up her cigarettes and lighter from the kitchen counter and walked out, letting the door slam. At the bottom of the steps, she spun around and went back into the kitchen to take her plaid flannel shirt from the hook by the door and a piece of leftover fry bread from the bowl on the table. That's yesterday's, cautioned Margie. I'll eat it before I get to the road. Crystal squeezed her mother's shoulder. You know, the cabin's a dump. See you later. At the bottom of the stairs, she called back. They better let you into blackjack training, those bastards. If they're letting Teresa do it, they better let you too. She walked as she always did, quickly, impatiently, with a long, short-legged stride down the driveway and to the road. As Margie absent-mindedly bit into a piece of day-old fry bread, she wondered to herself when the cabin's barrel stove had last been cleaned and if the back door had been properly latched. One of the worst jobs to do once it gets cold, cleaning up a dirty oven in a freezing room, she said to herself. Even worse job if a raccoon gets in. She microwaved a cup of instant coffee, positioned her arch supports into Joe Wash's old moccasins that waited for her feet, and then, still in her pajamas, sat outside on the log-splitting stump, dunking day-old fry bread and contemplating the cut-off path that led from Beryl's trailer back to the LaForce allotment house. Thank you very much. Gigwabaen.